In this week's episode, we'll be talking about Pulp Fiction and a bunch of other shit. Welcome to the Harsh Review Podcast, a film and movie podcast. This is the 19th episode. I'm your host, Ryan, and with me is my brother, Sean. How's it going, Sean? Hey, what's going on? Hey, what's up? How's your week been? It's been all right. It's been raining all week, so not a lot. A lot of time to stay indoors and, and watch movies and watch TV and be as unproductive as possible. How about you? I like the sound of that. Uh, the, the opposite spectrum, it's been a little hot where I'm at. So it's time to crank the AC and get the movies and television shows going, which I've been doing a little bit yeah. of. Yeah, I don't have an AC. I just have a fireplace. So kind of a uh, different, different spectrum there. But yeah, good. Nice. Yeah. Right so on. Let's talk about some uh, news here. Sean, what do you have for us in the news? Um, a couple things. Nothing too exciting. Just a couple things that caught my mind that or caught my eye that I thought were a little interesting. So one of our favorite directors, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, uh, recently directed something that was completely unknown to everybody. Uh, He actually recorded, uh, well, let me just back up. So Adam Sandler um, is trying to make a push back into stand-up, I guess. And he really is starting to kind of record like a special. Okay. And Paul Thomas Anderson is the one who directed it. Oh, okay. And they have a little connection, too, from Punch Drunk Love. They do, yeah. So they did something at the El Rey um, probably on, on April 11th, 2018, which most people didn't know when they went to see the performance. So that should be very interesting. I don't I don't necessarily know what he's going to add to a, a comedy special as far as what kind of direction is necessary. Uh, but it's, yeah. it's just an interesting kind of thing. Maybe just something to keep him busy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm not really seeing any like crazy editing or whatever. I think it's just you know most stand up specials just pretty straight up, not a lot of frills. So, no, absolutely, absolutely. And then other th- other than just you know PTA directing Adam Sandler on there, I did read an interesting uh, story about a week ago about Westworld and how the uh, showrunners are threatening to spoil all of season two, and this is kind of into. Uh, in response to a lot of the stuff that's been kind of going on with, with game of Thrones and just various shows like Westworld, where they kind of feel that like the way people are discussing the show's plots and things like that are kind of ruining the experience for other fans because there's so much speculation about which direction it goes and, and what people kind of gravitate to. Um, so there was, I read a story uh, originally this came up on uh, a Reddit AMA where the showrunner, uh, Jonathan Nolan, uh, kind of dropped that bombshell. So, you know, this is what I kind of just discuss a little bit about, but I'll, I'll read you, I'll kind of paraphrase mostly what he said on Reddit. Okay. Was that he says that fan theorizing creates a larger problem for us, though in terms of the way your guesswork is reported online, theories can actually be spoilers, and the line between the two is confusing. It's something we've been thinking about since last season. The fans of Game of Thrones, for instance, rallied around and protected the secrets of the narrative in part because they already knew those secrets through season five because they read the books. Uh, We thought about this long and hard and came to a difficult and potentially highly controversial decision. If you guys agree, we're going to post a video that lays out the plot and twists and turns of season two, everything, the whole thing up front. That way the members of the community here who want the season spoiled for them can watch ahead and then protect the rest of the community and help to distinguish between what's theory and what's spoiler. And then finally he went on to say, it's a new age and the new world in terms of a relationship between the folks making shows and the community watching them. And trust is a big part of that. We've made our cast part of this decision, and they're fully supportive. We're so excited to be in this with you guys together. So if this post reaches a 1,000 upvotes, we'll deliver the goods. And that's basically what he said. So I I thought it was just very interesting because it is – you know, we used to, when we grew up watching TV, I think the last show that really kind of had this was lost where yeah, you'd have to wait. And then they'd have like events and holidays. So you had to wait another week. So absolutely. And there's yeah. just, there was online discussion. There's a lot of podcasts that started kind of breaking through 
but there really wasn't this huge uh, hive mind of what was going on and where that culture was going. And uh-huh. and now they're kind of seeing it that when people are discussing things about what potentially could be in the show, if they're correct, it does spoil things for people because of all that speculation. And so they, they kind of liked the culture that Game of Thrones had and want to kind of bring that over to Westworld. Uh, uh-huh. I'm not quite sure, but I don't know. What do, what do you think of just that whole approach? Should we just stay with what tradition has had it or kind of take a new approach to engaging with your audience? I think, you know, a new approach is interesting, but regardless of what you put out there, people are still going to go online and discuss it and argue about it and get, you know, very crazy about it. So, uh, I mean, I, I think it's okay to maybe this show will be a testing ground for something like that. But if you don't do that, then you just might as well stay off the Internet or anything associated with the Westworld or Game of Thrones just so you don't get spoiled on you know, because it's changed a lot in that now we can tape these shows. We can watch them later uh, instead of having to w- actually be there around the time it, it airs. So sure, you're, you're going to have to make some some adjustments because there are people out there. And this is pretty much, it seems, all they do is uh, let's spoil this show for someone else. And then let's dissect this and, and guesstimate what's going to happen in the next episode. So it is an interesting approach and it is seems to me a little bit ballsy for them to just to come out and say that. And this is what we're going to do and uh, let's see what happens. So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, right now the, the culture is, is if you don't want something spoiled, uh, stay off of social media. And, and the yeah. problem, the problem with that is there, there has to be kind of a, you know, unspoken rule about etiquette in regards to social media, especially because everybody doesn't consume everything as fast as other people. True. So, so for example, when something like house of cards or these other series release everything all at once, there's people who are going to burn through it all in one sitting and then they jump on social media because they want to talk about it. And the culture that I hate about movie review sites and other blogs and things like that is it's, it's a race to be the first person to get something online because you want to be the first person to get those clicks and do that kind of stuff. But it's really shallow of content. It's it's more of the marketing strategy. There really isn't any soul to a lot of those posts. And it's anonymous. So it's like they feel that they can go off and say a bunch of stuff. They, they probably want to go into work the next day and go, hey, guess what happened to Han Solo? <laughs> you know, like when, yeah, but I, you know. I'm even talking about some of the biggest, like look at all the biggest names in, in the industry that do movie reviews and discussions and things like that without having to name anything in particular, you'll notice like which ones are really quick and first to post something. As soon as something comes out there, there's an intentional race to be the first right. to publish your review of this season or your review of this movie. And the, the harsh review is declined to, to participate in that race. I think, yeah, we're not, <laughs> we're not trying to compete with that level of urgency to get the clickbait right. to get the engagement. But where I'm going with this is that, in a community like Reddit, uh, it is self-policing. So if mm. I post something that people don't like, they're going to either downvote it, so it, it does not become to the top of that of that thread, and admins can even remove things. There's flags that you have to mark things for spoilers, and it's actually pretty safe to you know, browse through Reddit and not see a headline that says, um, oh, this is... This is what happened on Dexter season two or season four, or, you know, this is the thing about loss. Like you rarely are going to find something like that, um, be caught off guard, but on face, Facebook is not like that. Uh, Facebook, you can title your post, the name of the spoiler, you can show the image and then there's no way of avoiding it. And I think that that's the kind of culture that the showrunners of Westworld are trying to fight because they, they know that, the information is going to be out there. And so let's give the information to the right people who are going to self police each other in that community and help kind of keep that experience better for those who do not know. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. It's interesting I mean, to see. I'm curious. I'm going to pay attention to see how this develops, but I'm, I'm very curious about that. Yeah. And I mean, what is like the, what is the time or the amount of time that you should wait before you spoil something? Has that ever really truly been established or? No, I I, yeah. pers- I personally think um, that you have to look at, uh, let, let's say if it's a movie, then I typically go like three or four weeks. And I think that after that, it's kind of fair game. You've given someone enough time to go and see it, uh, especially because not all movies um, 
warrant a movie ticket in that whole experience, in my opinion. So yeah. te- technically, you're looking at once the movie is out to a few weeks after it's been released digitally or on Blu-ray is kind of like a, a large window. And we're really talking like 90 to 120 days, which is sure. damn near impossible to avoid with that. Um, and it's asking then, a lot for someone to keep a secret, basically. Yeah, I would agree. And, and I think for TV shows that come out, that are a serial where it's once a week, you're really looking at like five to seven days and kind of going, well, if you're, if, if you care about it being spoiled um, and you're not watching it within the week that it comes out, then I mean, I really have no, no pity or empathy for you. That's kind of the, the culture that is unavoidable in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at with, with those two. But again, they're really, that's a good question. I don't think there really is. Yeah, that's, that's spoken rule. Everyone will have a different opinion on that. It'd be interesting to see in the future if like Congress passes a law, you know? Oh yeah, protecting spoilers. You know, sure. the spoiler protecting protection yeah. act. The spoiler bill. Let's let's propose this one. Oh yeah, no kidding. It my, is, my, but might get to I, that point. I do like reading about the length of effort that movies are going through to avoid spoilers and that kind of stuff because there is that huge market which is strictly driven by by money and by clickbait and all that kind of stuff. So, so for example, uh, when Ryan Johnson was doing star Wars, he had like a MacBook air uh, that he bought and wrote the script on. And that was the only thing he did with that computer. It was bricked from the cloud. So it, it did not, was not online. You couldn't access it or anything. It was just for that script. Nice. Yeah. And, and, and there's lots of ways to where, you know, the actors on set would get their, their pages in like little iPads that were encrypted iPads. And after a certain period of time, the content would disappear. There's like all kinds of different ways. Like the actors aren't even getting their scripts beyond like a 24 hour window. Or they're getting uh, like just the part of the script where they, they it's only their lines. That, that's absolutely. pretty common. That's pretty common too. I know like directors like Kubrick and uh, PTA work like that, where uh, always, they're, they're always their, their sets and their, what they're doing is always shrouded in mystery and you're gonna have to wait and find out. And I, I think that's pretty cool. I, I think they, as the auteur or the writer of the film has every right to do that. Yeah, that's a little, true. A little harder with television though. Cause it's, it's just almost like you're being bombarded with content and then sometimes you, you can't get to the show you want to see always right away. Well, and it also depends if you're filming your movie in a, in a linear fashion or if the way that the scenes are chopped up, yeah. It's kind of unavoidable. You might be filming scenes that are in the back third of the movie first. Um, yeah. But what I, what I do know is that there are some actors and things out there that do appreciate that because they're kind of discovering this, their character's journey through the movie uh, by not being able to read from beginning to end. And mm-hmm. that kind of can help some people's performance. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What, you got any more news for us? Uh, no, that's what I got. What about you? you anything catch your eye? No, I, I do have a, a book, though. I've just started reading. I wanted to kind of plug. Uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of the film 2001 A Space Odyssey. Wow, and, uh, 50 yeah. years. Uh-huh. Uh, May 18th, they're going to be releasing the film uh, in select theaters in a 70 millimeter format. So... Uh, most likely when you remember hateful eight did that kind of road show with the 70 millimeter. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, me too. I mean, it, it it'll was, probably it was weird. <laughs> it, it is a little different. I mean, I mean for this 2001 re-release, there's going to be that um, there's going to be prior to that at con film festival. There's going to be a, a screening of that introduced by and uh, curated by Christopher Nolan. So he's going to be there kind of talking about what the movie means to him. And then, showing the film and maybe answering some questions. And then there'll be some, of course, like the Blu-ray and the 4K releases later in the year. But uh, this particular book is called Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke, and the Making of a Masterpiece. Uh, pretty new release here within the last month or so. I'm not that far into it, but it is shaping up to be a good book. It's highly readable. It's not like a lot of these kind of film um, analysis works where they're very dense and kind of hard to get mm-hmm. through. It's it's uh, highly enjoyable, and it's it's one of my favorite films. So it's it's just one of those movies where there's always going to be questions that you would like answers to, but sometimes things are left best um, ambiguous. Is it have color photos and things like that, or is it just a textbook? 
Yeah, it has color photos. So it has like one of those inserts in the middle with the color photos and then uh, regular black and white photos throughout. Okay. Um, you know, ha- has some uh, interviews with a lot of the principal people. Um, of course, Kubrick and Clark are no longer with us, so it's going to have a lot of those other kind of marginal characters that were involved with the film. But, you know, right one on. thing I... One thing I just one quick thing I've learned from the little bit of reading I've done is that when the movie came out, it was not really highly regarded at all. Um, so it, it took a long time for people to come around to it and to see what it really meant to them. And but I mean, in the time period, it wasn't wasn't very well received, which I think is interesting. Now it's a beloved film. Yeah. Sometimes it, the the public it takes a t- some time for them. It's one of those movies to where you can kind of tell the sophistication of a viewer when they see that. Um, like, so here's a, here's a, a rough analogy that I kind of compare this to. Okay. Uh, I was, I read a book about music in the brain and it was this huge study about how the brain physically reacts and develops and your ear develops when you listen to music. And the whole point about it is, um, if you listen to something like classical music, for example, or jazz music, and you don't like it. It says the reason why you don't like it is because your your brain and your ears subconsciously don't understand the tension and the and the release um and the and the harmonies and the melodies and things like that. Like you haven't listened enough in order to actually enjoy it. So okay. your first your first impressions you're going to listen to music and go like, yeah, this is not for me. It's like, well, of course it's not for you. This takes hours and hours and hours of listening to before you can start to to hear the things that you need to appreciate. And, and so that, that's the same, or if you listen to a lot of, uh, Eastern music that uses a different scale than a, a 12, 12 step Western scale, we don't understand that music and you hear it and it sounds very foreign because the, the harmonies, the melodies and the way that the scale work is very different. It takes a lot of conditioning and we're not I, and used I to it. We're not used to it. And, and I would say that the same kind of analogy applies to a lot of movies like 2001, yeah. where a contemporary uh, uh, you know, film fans going to watch it and you're not going to get the resolution and you're not going to get the same type of things that you're used to. It's the type of movie you leave the theater having to have those conversations and really analyze and go, I'm going to need to give that a couple more goes. Sure. Uh, and it was like that for me. I mean, when I first yeah. watched it, you just kind of go, what the fuck? But yeah. then af- what, after what is a, this? Yeah. After a while you start to kind of, study what was the intention what is this trying to say what is that and you start to see that and then you really learn how to appreciate it yeah Uh, so i feel like a new audience is starting to discover this one yeah and and i mean it's interesting too at the time period it came out uh, 1968 you know kubrick knew his audience it was the 60s of course he wasn't a a drug taker at all but uh you know there's certain parts of the film that i i guess adapt very well to people going in just you know stoned off their minds so um, you know, he kind of played to that too, but he, he really took the film medium to a whole new level and with a genre that up to that point had really been kind of a joke, um, the science fiction genre. So that's true. You know, so yeah, good, uh, good book so far. I'm looking forward to getting more into it. Sweet. Yeah. Right let's, on. Let's take a look at, uh, what we've been watching lately. You want to start this one off, Sean? What, yeah. What have you, so what have you been watching lately? I've still been uh, working through all of these Marvel movies, getting ready for Avengers. Uh, it's Look a big task to take. I know it's a big task to take on if you want to get through all of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And and actually, the second time I'm going through all these, being a, a big fan of the the, the comics. I'm picking up on so many details that I just did not get the first time uh, I saw a lot of these movies and just how well structured and interwoven they are um, and how well written they are to where it all kind of connects together. So it really takes takes a lot of uh, uh, intent and purpose to achieve that. So so this week, uh, I'm kind of chipping through. I went and saw, I saw Avengers Age of Ultron again. Uh, that's got James Spader as, as Ultron. I, I just kept hearing Robert California the whole time, but he does a great <laughs> job with the voice acting. Yeah. Um, and that's a pretty good movie too. I really enjoyed that one even more so this time. Cause it's, it's a pretty pivotal, pivotal on 
where the story arc continues. Okay. Uh, there's a little bit of a sidestep with Ant-Man, which which I appreciate because it's kind of like Doctor Strange where uh, it, it's a unique enough superhero and it has its own point of view and telling the story where it's kind of refreshing, although it's in that same uh, cinematic universe. I, I feel a, like... Got a goofy, that movie. It, it, it is, but that's what I kind of <laughs> like about it. Um, yeah. And it's, it's it's definitely quirky enough to where it's like, oh, it's this nice little refresher from the other stuff, which is kind of serious at points. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then Captain America Civil War, which is a little bit of a, a longer one, but it's still pretty good. It kind of reminds me that, yeah, we're, we're, we are left hanging uh, at the end of uh, Civil, War, Civil War where the Avengers, like what's how they all going to kind of get back together. And there's a lot of different stories that now... I'll I'll kind of know what to watch for when we go and see uh, Infinity War. So nice. pretty pretty excited to hammer hammer through some more of those. I got a couple more um, coming up, so I got to get back watch Doctor Strange again, which I really like. The uh, Spider Man Homecoming, Thor Ragnarok, Black Panther, which will be out digital in just a couple weeks, right before. Cool. Um, and then we're ready to go for the twentieth film, which is Avengers Infinity War. Nice. Yeah. What about you? Uh, well, I got three for you, and uh, two of them from the old Red Box, and one of them is on HBO. All so right. I'll just kind of go down each one and give my brief little critique. Uh, the first one I saw is Molly's Game, and this stars uh, Jessica Chastain, Michael Sarah, the Scottish dude from uh, Bridesmaids. Of, uh-huh. uh, Kevin Costner's in there. He's actually pretty good. Um, it's written by Aaron Sorkin. It's his first uh, directorial debut, or it's, it is his directorial debut. Um, it's a fact-based story. It's about a girl who kind of rose up in the ranks and started this uh, po- kind of poker, you know, poker game uh, with a lot of like celebrities and people of interest involved, and then she ended up being indicted. So, um, pretty much what you can expect from Aaron Sorkin, you know, the snappy dialogue, very fast-paced. I I enjoyed it. I think it was maybe 20 minutes too long, but I uh, I did enjoy it. I don't know if uh, this is on your radar at all, Sean. I've heard of the name, but I haven't really looked too much into it. Uh, sounds like a great cast. I'll have to give this a check uh, a chance. Yeah, it, it wasn't bad. You know, I I, uh, I enjoyed it. It was an interesting story, just to kind of see, um, you know, exactly what who was involved and kind of the you know, what happens when you get a little too involved with gambling that's not involved with a casino because obviously you're going to mm-hmm. run afoul of the mob in some way. So uh, cool. that, that was good. Very entertaining. Uh, not, not too heavy. Um, second one I saw was Phantom Thread, and this was uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's latest. Oh, you got her out? I almost watched that this week, but I, I, was, I didn't have enough caffeine going in me. I felt like this one's going to be a slow. So what did you think? Yeah, it's it's a different movie, man. It's um, it's supposedly Daniel Day Lewis says it's his last movie. It's a swan um, song, right? Yeah, and I kind of hate when people do that. It, mostly, it's like I you know, know. band tribute band. Yeah, yeah, like the the Who's done that about five times. You know, they say oh, this is our last tour, and then they're back like a couple years later. Um, so I mean, I don't think it's like the best movie for him to end with. It it was a decent movie. It, it is very slow. The music, of course, by Johnny Greenwood is excellent. Um, the, the acting was good. It's basically about this guy who, you know, he's a dressmaker, very high up there in 1950s England, and very OCD, you know, very in control of his own little world. And then he kind of meets his match in this uh, woman. And, you know, the whole movie just kind of unfolds as there's this kind of power struggle back and forth between them. So, you know, a lot of scenes reminded me a little more of like maybe a play. But it's it's not really like if you see it, there's really no distinctive kind of Paul Thomas Anderson thing about it at all. So it, it's definitely a departure for him. It's beautifully shot, um, but definitely uh, definitely an interesting film. Uh, kind of like a lot of his other movies, it will be uh, somewhat polarizing to audiences, where some people might go in expecting one thing and then get something completely different out of it. Yeah. So is it good? Did you like it? I liked it. it it's just it was a different movie, man. I mean, it's. I mean, I I enjoyed it, but you know, it didn't really kind of have that epic build up that a lot of his films do. It, you yeah. know, it gets, it gets a little twisted. Uh, you know, about halfway through it, nothing like too crazy. But um, I enjoyed it. I, I would recommend it to people who like his movies. 
I, I think he has taken a couple missteps throughout the years with, with some of his work. With a lot yeah, of well, you know, was it a lot better of his, than Inherent Vice? I think so. And the thing about Inherent Vice was adapted from a book uh, by a writer who I've read, and you know, whose a lot of stuff is very like unfilmable. So yeah, you know, I didn't with, like that movie. Yeah, and, and the book is you know I've read the book Inherent Vice, and it's a lot like it's trying to be like a Big Lebowski. Okay, but you know, like a very weird kind of book. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so yeah, I mean. It, Inherent Vice, I didn't really care for that. Um, you know, this one is better, I think, than that one. Um, I just don't, I'm not sure what he's going to do next. It's interesting that he's kind of jumping around different genres, you know, like a, like a Kubrick or a Spielberg or someone like that. So, yeah, it, it's, I think that he's kind of in that little niche where Christopher Nolan kind of sat before he went blockbuster. And I really kind of feel like um, this is something to where, Paul Thomas Anderson needs to take a crack at something a little bit more mainstream. I, right. I, I feel like he needs to get a little bit more uh, exposure and, and do something a little bit more, um, I don't know, just straightforward movie. Not, not something that's so quirky or artsy, but yeah. maybe that's, that's where he wants to stay. And I agree that he, he does, he's not too accessible and he hasn't been making accessible movies for a little while. So yeah. I'm curious to see if he turns that corner. I mean, since, you know, since there will be blood, which we've already talked about, you know, his movies have been very like intense. So I can see how they can put off a lot of people who are just walking in to see what they might think is like a romantic kind of comedy movie. You know, which you, I mean, there are parts in, in Phantom Thread that are kind of funny. Um, not like laugh out loud, funny, but slightly amusing, but it is it's clever. Very, yeah, very intense kind of movie. So, yeah, yeah, cool. All right, sweet. Phantom Thread. Yeah, and then the last one uh, I did check out a couple nights ago. There's a new documentary on HBO. It's about Andre the Giant. I've I've seen the advertisements for it, but uh, I haven't I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, you know, been looking forward to this one for a little while. Um, we kind of grew up on this guy. If you were paying attention to wrestling when you were a kid, uh, the documentary is very good. Or Princess Bride. Oh yeah, there yeah, that one too, which this film does cover. Um, but the documentary, I mean, a lot of it's just kind of really sad. I mean, just he, he lived kind of a sad life, even though he he was you know trying to enjoy himself as much as possible. But um, you know, obviously because of his size and, and his condition, he was in a lot of pain. You know, majority of the time. So big, you know, big drinker tried to curb a lot of his pain with through drinking. Um, one story has it that he drank about a hundred beers a night in a night. Yeah. Didn't even get drunk. Yeah. And he wasn't even like really wasted. And then, and, you know, um, but he'd go places like overseas and he'd just get kind of laughed at and made fun of. And, um, so, you know, kind of, kind of a sad documentary, but if you want to know more about his life, there's a lot of great footage, a lot of good interviews with, uh, especially like Hulk Hogan, Vince McMahon, people that were close to him. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's pretty short. It's like an hour and a half. So definitely but Arnold, works. is he in there? Arnold's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. He's in there. He's looking all right. It's not looking too bad. Right on. Andre the Giant documentary HBO. Yes. So yeah, uh, the, the last thing for me that I saw uh, was Stronger. Have you heard of that one? Stronger. Um, who's it's in that? It's the uh, Jake... Jalen Hall plays the the dude that got his legs blown off in oh. the uh, Boston Marathon. Okay, okay. Um, and it was on like an iTunes rental, so I was like, you know what, ninety nine cents. I said I'll I'll pretty much bite on any ninety nine cent rental. Check it out. Yeah. Um. Yeah. He he plays what's the guy? I'm trying to think of the character's name. Jeff Bowman. Okay. And he was somebody who's just kind of like a guy who works at Costco, kind of a nobody, bit of a drunk. And really likes this girl that he's kind of had on and off relationships with. So he finally decides she's running the marathon and he wants to go and root her on when she crosses the finish line. And so he's standing right there. He saw the, the one of the bombers and was kind of like right at ground zero on the explosion and lost, lost both his legs uh, below the knees, which they had to like kind of amputate him above the knees. So it's really about his journey through that process. Uh-huh. Um, but it's interesting to me because we've seen a lot of movies like this where somebody yeah. has some tra- uh, tragedy and how they overcome it. But this one kind of chose to go in a little bit of a different direction. 
which on one hand I appreciated, but on the other hand, it wasn't really the movie that I wanted. So, so for example, they spent a lot of time just really about him, the struggles of, there's a little bit of the struggles of adjusting with that and accepting your, your situation, which I think he did a great job playing that there's definitely some really killer scenes that kind of showed you how difficult it is to live without legs and yeah. just little things to where I mean, they're showing him go to the bathroom, trying to take a shower, just getting around, like just common things that you've done before. And then it kind of just stays in this area where like his mom, he's around, he's not rich, you know, he's not a, a, a person of means. And yeah. His mom tries to capitalize on his injury and get him as much press and stuff as possible, but he doesn't uh, like that. Yeah. Um, and he's kind of doing the whole press bit a little bit and people are putting him up as a beacon of hope, Boston strong and the terrorists can't beat us, but he doesn't want that, you know, cause he, he, he just wants to kind of be left alone and, and kind of work through his, his struggles. Um, and there's a little bit of a recovery redemption part at the end, but that's actually the recovery process is a smaller portion of the film where, where the way it's advertised and the way that it's, marketed seems to be what I was expecting to be a big part of the movie. Um, huh. and they really didn't spend much time on that. They really kind of just stayed in this, you know, how much it sucks to be in his situation and how he's struggling with that, uh, becoming a drunk and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, yeah. so definitely took a different direction, but it was a really good story is, is didn't happen that long ago. Um, Joan Hall did a great job kind of acting the role felt slightly like one of those Oscar bait kind of movies to where he wants to take on a role that's going to showcase his range as, uh, as an actor, which he clearly did. Yeah. Uh, but it, there, it, it seemed to be kind of lacking that it factor a little bit to make it stand out a little bit more, um, uh, compared to other movies of this type. So, yeah, I I'm sure, it. I'm sure there's like a out. lot of, so sure there's a lot of other stories like this, but you know, it's kind of unique in that this story made it to the screen, right? Yeah. And, and the thing that I'm most paranoid about with movies like this is how much Hollywood influence there is. Yeah. You know, so I did a little bit of research just to kind of get an idea of, is this ac- actually it? Like, so for example, when he wakes up from his surgery, uh, there's a, one of the first things he, he does is ask for a pen and paper and writes, he writes down, I saw the bomber, you know, like, is that real? And then the FBI are there and he's the first person to kind of ID what the person looks like. Now, did that really happen in that order of events? I don't remember that happening. Yeah, I know. But I mean, I don't know if it did or not. I haven't, haven't done that level of research, but those are some of the things that kind of catch my eye a little bit of going, all right, are they, are they trying to make this an uplifting positive story against terrorism? Uh, Is this, is this really what, what happened? I'm not quite sure. And there's one Does, scene in there though, that was, I thought probably the best scene in the movie to where he's now kind of coming to grips that he doesn't have his legs. He's in the hospital bed and you can kind of see his legs all bandaged up right above the knees. So he's got his little stumps and they have to change out his gauze and his padding and stuff. And they're trying to remove it. And it's like just a really painful process. Yeah. Uh, and just, they just let the camera roll while they do the whole thing. Oh, um, yeah, it's really good. And yeah. the way they filmed it and the CGI of kind of getting rid of his legs and all that kind of stuff is really good. So yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. I, I enjoyed it. I'd probably give it a you know, seven out of 10, somewhere in that ballpark. Does it start with that? Like this is based on a true story. Kind of yeah. It, it tells you a little bit of kind of getting you, uh, I don't think it actually said anything up front to be honest. Okay. I, think they, I think they kind of did at the end of the movie. Uh, I guess they're assuming, you know, what's, it's one of those ones where you know what's going to happen and you know what the what the story arc is. So it's like, let's introduce you to all the characters and uh-huh. you know what's going to happen. You know the guy loses his leg, so how does that happen? And if you spend too much time before you get there, uh, you can kind of lose interest a little bit. And they were right on the line of kind of going like, move it along. Let's get to yeah. Let's get to the main thing that drives this movie. Sure. Um, and then when they kind of get there, it starts to intrigue you and then it just kind of goes flat for such a long part of the movie where you just kind of get sick and tired of watching this guy continue to be a, a fuck up and just drink and do stupid things. Although you're supposed to emphasize with his, his challenges. Yeah. You, you don't because everybody around him altered their life to give him the support he needs. So he's just and, kind of a dick. 
He, exactly. He is just <laughs> a, not a likable That's person. Ungrateful at all. dick. Yeah. And there's really no redeeming factor for him. Uh, so I don't know is, if that's like a true representation of how this person is. Uh, yeah. But but the way the media portrays him is that that's not the case. And so you get this weird polarization, which was a unique part of the story. But I'm I'm not sure. It's okay. it's, a, it's a good watch. Hollywood does that a lot. You know, they front load that this is based on a true story, and it's like okay, based, but then they take a bunch of other shit, and you know, they'll, sometimes they'll composite characters as well just to kind of save screen time because they have to. Um, yeah. You know, like two characters become one all of a sudden. So, um, yeah, sometimes with movies like this, unfortunately, you have to maybe do your homework a little bit or before or after just to kind of discern if what you just saw or well about to see is real or factual completely. Sure. Well, well, the other movie uh, that Mark Wahlberg was in, uh, Patriot's Day, that talked about the Boston uh, explosion, Hollywood pretty much created oh, yeah. his character and had him kind of in the middle of everything to tell this story, which is another example to where it's still a decent movie. Yeah. Um, it's well made. It's well cast and, and acted and everything, but it's not actual as far as we're going to tell the point of view through this one beat cop who just happens to be in the mix on everything. Um, I don't know. It just, that's the kind of the criticism that it receives is that that's not really how this went down. Don't, don't glorify this one person. Right. So I'm just a, maybe a little more sensitive to you got to make money and you got to provide some entertainment in there. Yeah. Um, I, and I felt like it had, had some strong moments, but other times it did. And so take it for what it is. Okay. Yeah. All right. All well, right. that that's what we've been watching. That's what we've been watching this week. Let's move on. Shall we? Let's do it. What are we, uh, what are we talking about, Ryan? Well, this week we're going to be talking about, the classic Pulp Fiction. fiction i before i really dive into the movie i wanted to share uh just my initial thoughts my initial feelings and reactions to it i do remember our mother taking us to see this movie when it came out yeah your recommendation uh, uh-huh yeah so early film buff of course let's go see pulp fiction i'm sure, sure it's not I'm sure it's not too violent right i, I was 15 so yes. this, this came out in 94 i was 15 uh-huh. you're a couple years older than me yeah um had no idea what it was. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, <laughs> you know, more or less like my one big memory of the movie is is there's a scene where uh, where John Travolta puts the, you know, the adrenaline shot into Uma Thurman because she's OD'd on heroin. And uh, I just remember in that scene, it's it, like a lot of Tarantino scenes. It's very intense and tense. And someone in the audience like screamed. Um, oh, okay. I don't so, remember that. Yeah, that's something I remember, and that kind of encapsulates your your feeling about this movie because, yeah. Um, to me, like if I wanted to draw any kind of like analogy, I, I would say that you know, Pulp Fiction uh, did to the movie industry kind of like what the band Nirvana did to the music industry. Whereas, you know, pr- previously to Pulp Fiction, there you know the movies that coming out were all that uh, great, and you know they're just getting a little bit too derivative. And then this movie comes along and kind of shakes things up and changes a lot. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely, as a film, it's very much an experience. It's something that you would have to see in the theater to truly appreciate it uh, if you saw it the first time. And, uh, you know, something that's quite unforgettable in terms yeah. of the film. You know, a lot of people consider it one of Quentin's best films. Um, I don't consider it maybe his best film, but I, I do consider it to be one of his strongest films. and one of his most remarkable achievements. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, for me, I remember when we went and saw that, not really knowing what it was, you kind of have a little bit of that, uh, embarrassment because of the, the content of the movie and you're sitting there watching with your mom. Like, I don't oh, know. Yeah. I wasn't too comfortable sitting there watching Marcellus get pounded while you're like, hey, Oh mom, yeah. Great. Yeah. Great movie. Right. Yeah. Thumbs <laughs> um, up. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, what's going on? <laughs> 
I definitely enjoyed it a lot because it was a surprise when you're when you're kind of watching that. Um, and I would agree as far as for Quentin Tarantino, I think it's a movie that kind of best uh, summarizes his uh, point of view on on movie taking. Uh, right. If you had to, if you go, I've never seen a Quentin movie. You're going to want to start there. Sure. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Reservoir Dogs. I appreciate it. Uh, I just, that one just does not age well for me. Um, yeah. I think the dialogue is kind of great, but it's almost a little too clever, lacks some of the authenticity. And this one's just a lot more polished all around, which you can right. kind of tell. Um, so uh, yeah, I would agree that he, he has improved significantly since then, but I like seeing that raw talent, the smaller budget, uh, the, you know, bringing Travolta back in the spotlight an introduction right. to Samuel Jackson, and aside from what he was in Jurassic Park earlier than this one, not I didn't really know him much as an actor. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of new new things for me in this movie. And, and I mean, you know, it kind of launched a lot of people's you know acting career, or either launched it or kind of relaunched it, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. So, um, yeah, it came out in 1994, directed by Quentin Tarantino. It was based on a story by Tarantino and another guy named Roger Avery. And uh, it takes place all in Los Angeles, made for $8 million at the time, uh, $5 million of which That's went crazy. to the actor's salaries. So kind of kind of interesting that, you know, $3 million is left over for everything else after the actors were paid. But some of the actors, like uh, Travolta, did take a significant pay cut to do this film, which I found to be uh, fairly interesting. Um, a lot of like during the film, it's very kind of untraditional where you have everything is shot out of chronological order. So the plot is not like a straight up linear plot. It's all out of order with seven main sequences. And then you're going to have like a lot of these kind of monologues and casual conversations going on, uh, revolving around a whole host of subjects. When Tarantino took this script originally to Columbia TriStar, they said it was uh, too demented and too twisted, and they didn't want to glorify drug use or violence at all, because uh, this movie is definitely full of that. And it was uh, one person who took it to the now infamous Harvey Weinstein and convinced him to make it into a film, and that person was Danny DeVito. And, wow, I didn't know that. Danny DeVito is tagged as an executive producer on this film, but it was really Danny who took that film uh, two Miramax, who at that time were, you know, they had been around for a bit, but they're, you know, they're now pretty well known for starting up a lot of these independent movies and having given the directors that we see today, like their start. So um, that's where it would be made by uh, Miramax. Hmm. Interesting. I wanted to go through uh, a lot of the different kind of sequences in this film. I didn't want to talk about the plot too much, but do you have like a favorite scene or a favorite character from this, Sean? That's a it's a that's kind of tough. I actually kind of liked Quentin Tarantino in this movie because uh, he's Samuel Jackson's got a lot of great comedic discussion, very similar to like how Big Lebowski does it. Uh, right. But I I did like when uh, not knowing when I saw the movie who Quentin Tarantino was, I did like his character and his house and the people coming in there, and I like that whole scene when they're at his house. Right. So that that would be probably one of my one of my favorite ones. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, you know, it's like different. <laughs> yeah, there's always like there's just a lot of different like characters that are pretty unique, and it's also unique to the fact that when Quentin wrote this, um, he wrote a lot of the characters specifically for specific actors. So, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, kind of the, the cast. I'll go through the cast. We have John Travolta as uh, Vincent Vega. Now, uh, Travolta was not the original choice for this. Um, it was originally Michael Madsen. Okay. We know Michael oh, Madsen right. from yeah. Reservoir, Reservoir Dogs. However, uh, Michael Madsen decided to go and do Wyatt Earp with Kevin Costner instead. And that was a choice that he, uh, you know, sincerely regretted later on. Because, uh, yeah, um, I would agree. Yeah. Tarantino had specifically tagged him to kind of do this film. So um, as he was developing the film, uh, Harvey Weinstein was pushing for Daniel Day Lewis to do the movie. Um, but you know, and they kind of settled on a lot of different things initially when, before Tarantino really wrote the whole screenplay, he wanted it to be two British guys. So he wanted, uh, Gary Oldman in the Jules role 
and he wanted Tim Roth in the Travolta role, the Vincent Vega role. Mm. Um, that was kind of an original conception of the film, but eventually settled on John Travolta, who uh, took a reduced rate, like I said earlier, anywhere from uh, 100000 to $140,000 is you know the rumor in terms of how much he took. But uh, he was nominated for an Academy Award, and it pretty much revitalized his career because right before this movie, he was doing Look Who's Talking. So Yeah, he wasn't doing a whole lot. No. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you know but, but Tarantino had really admired this guy from his work in the 70s, and Saturday Night Fever, Welcome Back, Cotton, yeah. Greece. So kind of wanted him to, to take this role on, and I think he did a really good job. I think it was definitely out of character for him that, you know, we've come to know him as. Um, since this movie, he hasn't made the best choices with a lot of stuff he's done. And then some things like the OJ Simpson, um, uh, series have just yeah. been kind of weird, but Zenu hasn't been too kind to him since then. No, but, uh, no. So uh, I do remember, uh, I do remember there was a quote that I have, I wrote down here that, uh, uh, Travolta said when about this movie and his casting, he said, I remember it was a big deal with Miramax too, because Daniel day was hotter than heck and I was colder than Alaska. So the uh, idea that Quentin went for me over Daniel day Lewis was a very big deal. Uh, but then he went on to say, but I understand now in retrospect, why he did by using Uma, me and Bruce, he balanced it with pop culture and that would have happened with Daniel day or anyone else vying for that part. Huh? Yeah. A little, little, uh, clever with, uh, kind of, bringing that, that character in, which was pretty smart to do. Yeah. So, uh, and Vincent's a hitman in the film. He has a heroin addiction. His partner is Jules Winfield played by, uh, of course, Samuel L. Jackson. Tarantino had wrote this for the part of, uh, Samuel L. Jackson to play in mind. Um, but he had to go through a couple auditions before he actually got the part. Originally in the script, he was said to have a gigantic Afro, but, um, <laughs> one day, yeah, you know, but uh, one of the costume people had gone out and got like a Jerry Curl wig and, uh, yeah. you know, put it on them. And then they, they felt that was more right for the for the part. Huh. Which, which is interesting. Um, and Samuel L. Jackson also received an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor in this film. Wow, and good for him. Yeah. Um, it really kind of kick-started, again, his career. He's been in pretty much every Tarantino movie, I, I think, for except for Death Proof. But he's had some kind of role, like, you know, even in, like, Glorious Bastards, he had, like, a really quick, like, voiceover part. But he's been involved with Tarantino in pretty much everything he's done, so. It's a great combo. It is, yeah. And it's always interesting to see, like, what kind of role Tarantino will have for him. Um, you know, because I think in Django and Chain, that was, like, a great role to put him in. Um, display this asshole, you know, more or less, but yeah, yeah, you know, different, different kind of roles for him. Um, another Tarantino favorite was Uma Thurman as Mia Wallace and, uh, Miramax wanted Holly Hunter or make Ryan to play this role. Uh, but Tarantino really wanted Uma to do this after their first meeting. She had initially said no, but he, I guess he called her up and like read her the script and more or less convinced her to do it. Um, she would be doing uh, Kill Bill with him later on, 2003. So that's that role. Yeah, that's another good pick. And, and she looks pretty different in this movie, too, with the wig and the, and the look. And so I like this one for her right? Her her resume, because it definitely stands out with a lot of the types of movies that she's done. I mean, outside mm-hmm. of Tarantino movies, I, I don't really know her too well. Right, right. Um, Bruce Willis plays Butch Coolidge. Uh, Willis was at that time a major star, but a lot of his recent films like Hudson Hawk have been big, big disappointments. Um, Tarantino really liked the look of him. He said he looked like kind of like a fifties actor. And uh, again, it's a, it's a great role for him. Uh, he's in that, that controversial scene you mentioned earlier with, uh, with Ving Rhames. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty interesting to hmm. see him do something like this. Um, Harvey Keitel plays the wolf. That's a part that Tarantino wrote specifically for him. Uh, he had done Reservoir Dogs with them before. So uh, that was another one. We have Tim Roth uh, as Ringo uh, slash Pumpkin. He had also been in Reservoir Dogs. Um, he used an American accent in Reservoir Dogs, but in this one he uses his London accent. And uh, he wrote the part with Roth in mind, but then initially... When he had shot the movie to TriStar, they wanted Johnny Depp or Christian Slater to play it. And then he's joined by Amanda Plummer, who plays Honey Bunny. And um, 
That's another one Tarantino had wrote specifically for her. And then we have uh, Ving Rhames, who was cast in the part of Marcellus Wallace, who, uh, you know, for a lot of the movie, you don't really see his face. Yeah, uh, you don't really see yeah. see too much. Yeah, it's just kind of like, you know, um, but you see his presence. Definitely a, definitely a great role. He has really, like, a couple of really good lines in this film. But, um, you know, he this kind of led him to be cast to a lot of different stuff, like Mission Impossible, Out of Sight, and Con Air later on. So yeah. And and going going back real quick to yeah because you talked about Bruce Willis uh, the boxer and uh, I I mean I was reading about this one initially about how uh, it was cast to that that part was promised to Matt Dillon oh yeah uh huh and so Dillon basically said I love it let me sleep on it um, but uh, um, Travolta thought that Bruce Willis would have been a better Butch Coolidge. And ah. so he eventually kind of convinced Tarantino. So when Dylan said, I love the script, let me sleep on it. Um, Tarantino called up his agent and said, he's out. If he can't tell me face to face that he wants to be in the movie after he read the script, he's out. So that, that was his angle to kind of like push him out and bring Bruce Willis in whose stock wasn't really too high wow. at, at the time. Interesting. Um, and, and Bruce Willis was that big movie star that Quentin Tarantino needed in order to get uh, Harvey on board. Um, because of that, and then made the movie, I guess, according to Quentin Tarantino as legit. So okay. without Bruce Willis, uh, Miramax would have never have gotten on board. Cause you need that big star, you know? Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Um, we have Eric Stoltz as Lance, the drug dealer. Uh, this is a very funny uh, part. I like this part a lot. Um, the very imaginative Courtney Love later said that Kurt Cobain was supposed to be offered the role. And that if he had taken it, that uh, Courtney would be playing his wife. Although uh, Tarantino denies this, that he, he never met Cobain and he says he never offered him the part. Uh, yeah, so. a little too convenient. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It sounds a little too good to be true. Yeah. Um, Gary Oldman was was uh, in consideration for this part because he had played kind of a, a slightly similar role in True Romance. Um, and then actually Tarantino, who likes to put himself in his movies for some reason, uh, he was going to play this part of Lance, but um, it came down to him either playing Lance or Jimmy, who shows up later in the movie. He decided to go with Jimmy because he wanted to be behind the camera for the, the part where uh, Mia overdoses and they have to revive her. So, yeah, interesting. Um, and then we have, a, of course, last one. Christopher Walken shows up as uh, Captain Coons. He gives a very memorable uh, monologue. Remember what that monologue entailed, Sean? Who who is this again? Uh, Christopher Walken. Oh, uh, is this the uh, watch in the ass? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, that's you know, great. <laughs> interesting. You know, basically, this kind of sets up the whole importance of of uh, Bruce Willis and that watch, and that you know he's he's basically been offered to take money to th- to throw a fight, which he does not. He ends up killing the opponent, and he has to escape from Marcellus. But his uh, watch that has this great significance because it was up his dad's ass for like eight years or something in a POW camp is left behind at the apartment. So he has to go back and get it. And that, you know, creates a whole bunch of problems. So that's yeah, the cat. That was, that was pretty clever. Uh, yeah. Clever there. Just to kind of in- insert that part in there. Um, so basically, like the, the, the screenplay for this film started in about 1990. Um when it was writing and there was just a kind of a lot of different takes on it. You know, Tarantino wanted to make a trilogy type film where, and he, to me, like Tarantino is, is a lot more of a writer. Uh, first and foremost, he's an outstanding director, but he's also like a brilliant writer. And uh, he's a good how, storyteller. Exactly. And, and I mean, his dialogue is amazing. Um, but he, and, and with his directorial, stuff you can tell that he kind of pulls from all kinds of genres and different places that he's been exposed to so and he makes no bones about that and you know he he's really like a composite of not just film but television as well um but he wanted to make this kind of trilogy film where you know he said this is a quote he wanted to do something that novelists get a chance to do but filmmakers don't telling three separate stories having the characters float in and out with different weights depending on the story um so that's kind of what he what he did was he wanted to approach that. The, the really the only constant person in all the stories is uh, Vincent Vega. That's the Travolta role. 
Um, so he went to work on the script, actually got down to it in March of 1992. He was in Amsterdam and, uh, com- you know, completed the screenplay pretty much. Amsterdam is written into the screenplay because uh, at the beginning, Vincent has just come back from there. And that's where we talk about uh, the Royale with cheese, which is a very famous line. Um, so he, he has all that stuff in there. He came up with a couple of like fictional brands, which is the Big Kahuna Burger and the Red Apple Cigarettes, which are just kind of brands he made up for his films. And they, they do appear in a lot of his movies. Um, and then, you know, while he was working on this script, he was kind of wrapping up Reservoir Dogs and then uh, proceeded in 93, he had the script all done. So now he just had to get the money for it. So he had a producer, uh, Lawrence Bender. They had shot the film around. Um, I already told you about what TriStar said. And then it took yeah. Danny DeVito. You know, they, they took it to Miramax and had it done. So, um, you know, right like a Danny. Yeah, he made it happen, you know. Um, you know, critical response to this film uh, has a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. 9.1 out of 10. Um, you know, it's pretty well like loved by a lot of people. It, like we were talking earlier with 2001, it's, you know, one of those movies, like the first time you see it, it's going to be an obvious, like huge shock. Cause you, you don't know what you just saw, you know, you, you're not really sure how to digest it, but then you begin to appreciate it as it kind of, you know, as it, as you start to more or less digest it. Because in the course of about three hours, you're exposed to countless acts of violence a lot of racial epithets. There's a man rape, you know, there's a watch in someone's ass. There's a, a drug overdose. I mean, there's just all kinds of things that you may not have been exposed to. And the film also kind of sets a standard that a lot of movies before it have done like clockwork orange, which we've already talked about like Bonnie and Clyde, where it's this kind of ultra violent movie that um, really kind of come out at a, at a pivotal time in film history and then set a standard because this movie, as you may have seen over the years has been imitated countless times. It has. Yeah. It's got also like a, I wonder how much it would have inspired a movie like Memento or something like that as well. Um, It's got a Christopher Nolan esque kind of vibe to it with the structure and everything. Right. You know, and then even I remember, uh, you know, when Guy Ritchie movies started coming out, it was like, he's the British Tarantino, you know, and that's, that's kind of what a lot of people were saying. It's just kind of like, but you're not going to get really even closer as cool as Pulp Fiction has. Um, and that's kind of what, why this movie makes it stand out. Um, so a lot of like, you know, got different critical analysis of this film. There's a couple things I wanted to talk about. A lot of like pop culture references come up in this film. Um, anywhere from like, there's a flock of seagulls haircut reference. There's a, a Marilyn Monroe stuff. There's a, there's a restaurant that they go to, uh, Jack Rabbit Slims, which kind of pulls from a lot of different, uh, you know, fifties kind of, you know, pop culture. So we have a lot of that. So, you know, again, Tarantino combines all these things and it's not so much a rip off as it is an homage. So he creates an homage to all these different films that he's digested because I mean, there's certain scenes in here where you see, uh, with the hillbillies when they're, rape and Marcellus that can be that can Very be kind deliverance of, right exactly you know that, that can be compared to deliverance there's other things um that are kind of reminiscent of a Hitchcock some stuff that is reminiscent of Kubrick so I mean there's a lot of things that are in the film um even like Hitchcock there's a MacGuffin in this film What what is that MacGuffin Sean it's the briefcase yes so we have this briefcase that they're looking for in the beginning uh, the combination is 666, which is the number of the beast. And, uh, you know, Tarantino has said that there's no real explanation for his contents. It's more or less a plot device. Um, originally, he was supposed to have diamonds in there, but he decided it wasn't really going to work. So uh, they just, you know, basically took that out of the plot and they put a orange light bulb in there that was supposed to create some kind of otherworldly glow. Um, yeah, yeah. I was reading about the briefcase. There's a couple things because Tarantino just told to Travolta, uh, just be completely impressed, like something you've never seen before. Uh, but there's been a lot of theories about the contents of it. Um, did you hear about any of those? Well, there, there's the most popular one, which is it's Marcellus Wallace's soul, uh-huh. uh, um, which is kind of like a folklore thing where the devil's soul is taken out of the back or 
you know, if someone takes your soul, the devil takes your soul, it comes from the back of your neck. And, uh, you know, that's why they the band aid, right? Right. So there's a band aid on Marcel's Wallace's, you know, back of his neck the first time we see him. However, that was there because I guess Ving Rames was shaving his head and he cut himself and hence the band aid. So, um, you know, that, that's just kind of coincidental. But I don't know. What are the other, uh, what are the other theories you've been hearing about this? Uh, that it had Elvis's gold suit that was worn by uh, Val Kilmer in True Romance. Okay. Uh, all the way to like a copy of Spider Man number one. Ah. <laughs> so, yeah, there's been all kinds of random stuff in there. Okay. Uh, but it's, it is pretty clever because they don't give you the resolution that you want. Right. But yeah, and then, you know, Tarantino himself has said, you know, it's not really supposed to be anything at all. It's, it's basically whatever the viewer wants it to be, which I, I think is pretty cool. Um, you know, because it, it's kind of nice when the director doesn't have to tell you everything. It's okay for you to kind of, you know, think about what it might be or what it might not be. The point yeah. is it's, it's kind of a distractor from the film. Uh, there's a lot more other interesting things going on than just what's inside the briefcase. Um, there's a Bible passage that Jules recites uh, right before he kills somebody. And he says it three times in the film. Uh, this is not strictly a Bible passage. There are a few parts in the Bible, but a lot of it comes from a film called The Bodyguard with one of uh, Tarantino's favorite actors, Sonny Chiba. Not the one with uh, Kevin Costner? Not that one, <laughs> no. <laughs> <Yeah, so, laughs> you yeah. sure? Yeah, this is a, a Sonny Chiba film, 1976, Karate Kiba. Um, Sonny Chiba, it was an original film called Street Fighter. He was also cast as uh, Hitori Hanzo in Kill Bill. Um, so part of the part of the speech that is given is from that film. So it's you know again an homage to something else, and then part of it is from the Bible. Um, but that's pretty much you know yeah, what this, that, this is the last few lines, right? Exactly. So, um, and then there's also something about the bathroom, um, either like characters that are in the bathroom or need to use the bathroom at, at some point. And then this also kind of shows up in a few other Tarantino films. Um, True romance, whenever Christian Slater needs to have some kind of reckoning with himself, he goes into the bathroom and talks to Elvis, who uh, who you said is played by Val Kilmer. Um, but in this film, there's like a lot of different kind of references to the bathroom. Uh, you know, Mia goes in there to do some coke at the, when they're having dinner. Um, Butch and his girlfriend play an extended scene in their motel bathroom. There's a scene where uh, Brett is confronted uh, by Jules and Vincent about the money with the briefcase. And then a guy comes out of the bathroom shooting at them. And that kind of transform, transforms Jules in this moment of clarity that he has later. Um, but there's also three moments where Vincent goes to the bathroom and he comes back to a world where it's utterly changed. And it's like, you know, the threat of death is present. So. Vincent and Jules are having uh, dinner. Vincent goes to the bathroom. When he comes out, there's an armed robbery. Vincent's in the bathroom uh, when he's taking out Marcellus's wife. And then he comes out, and she's already overdosed because she's found his stash. And then there's also a stakeout at Butch's apartment where Vincent is. And then when he comes out, he sees Butch and is killed by Butch. So, you know, again, this is kind of like Tarantino's hallmark. This is one of the things he does, um, kind of using that bathroom as something uh, that can transform and change other people. That's an interesting uh, little brand to have and to put in there, uh, but it's right. clever. I, I like that. Yeah. You know, cause Tarantino has some stuff like he has a, obviously like a foot fetish as well. So that kind of shows up in a lot of different movies. Yeah, weird dudes. Has. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a couple other like little trivia things I wanted to throw in here before um, I wrap it up. Um, you know about the shot with Vincent uh, plunging the syringe into Mia's chest, right? Yeah, that that one's rad. Yeah, so basically, like that scene was um, it was done with starting with the needle being pulled out. So you know what you see is not like him actually doing that. They did that, you know, they did that with him starting with the syringe in her chest and then pulling it out, and then they run the film backwards. Okay, and you would know this because when Mia's revived. Uh, the mark on her chest has disappeared when she's waking up. So that's uh, kind of, oops. So yeah. So that's, that's a little thing they had. Like, I don't think they, they were trying to like logistically try to work it out, but they just said, okay, let's just start. Let's basically do it backwards and then run it forwards when we actually put the movie together. Um, yeah, it's a very common technique. It seemed to work very well here. Yeah. Um, 
two things in the movie actually belong to Quentin Tarantino. So one of them is the car that uh, is being driven by Vincent Vega. It's a 1964 Chevelle Malibu, and that belonged to Quentin Tarantino. And actually, when they were filming this movie, the car was stolen. Um, keep in mind, you know, <laughs> keep in mind that the film was uh, made in 94, right? Yeah. So flash forward to 2013, um, a cop sees two kids stripping an older car. Those kids get arrested, and then when they find the VIN, they find out that it was the car that was stolen from Tarantino like almost 20 years earlier. Oh, wow, so he never got it back till that long. Exactly. Like an owner had purchased it and had no idea it was a stolen car. So that's the, that's one thing that Tarantino... And then the other thing that belonged to Tarantino is uh, the wallet. You remember what the wallet said? Yeah, the uh, bad motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, so th- that wallet actually belonged to Tarantino. He, he liked to walk around with that wallet, and it's actually from uh, the theme of Shaft. Yeah, so, which is kind of funny because you know. Samuel Jackson went on to play Shaft. Right, yeah. In, two, so, in 2000. You know, little little foreshadowing there. Um, the word fuck is used in the movie 265 times. Um, Jeez. Yeah, one thing I never really picked up on like until re-watching the movie, just because you don't really listen for it, but in the opening sequence with Honey Bunny and Pumpkin, you can hear Jules talking in the background, um, which kind of lends... And then uh, you see Vincent entering the bathroom, which kind of lends itself to the continuity of the film, hmm. you know, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so, I mean, a lot of... Uh, oh, the Jackrabbit Slim, uh, slim set cost $150,000. So that was that was a pretty big deal to shoot that whole scene. It was in a uh, yeah, warehouse in uh, Culver City. That's so pretty was, cool. Yeah. And um, another person who was in consideration for the role of Butch was uh, Mickey Rourke, who passed on it because he wanted to pursue a boxing career of his own. Uh, he said he passed on it because he didn't understand the script. Yeah, I guess an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> you know, later, uh, you know, later uh, regretted, of course, his decision, just like everyone else who more or less passed on the movie. Yeah, so, it's always funny to hear how people take that gamble, and and I know it happens to lots of actors and actresses and stuff, but um, I, I think that uh, in hindsight, it's twenty always twenty twenty, but yeah. this was definitely a big whoops. Right, right. So, um, I mean, that's pretty much all I have on Pulp Fiction. It's just kind of closing thoughts uh, on this film. It's, it is one of my favorite movies. It's something that I always kind of return to and love every time. Like I'm seeing it for the first time. Um, definitely. Like I've met people who've never seen this film, believe it or not. I know uh, it's kind of crazy to think. Yeah. And it's just, it's, so it's either like either recommended or if they're around and the movies around, it's like, Hey, you want to watch Pulp Fiction? And then if you're do and I've done this before with one person, like if you do that, you're not really watching the movie, but you're watching their reaction to it, which is just, maybe just yeah, as that, that's part of the fun. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially if it's someone who you know has some has some stricter morals than her mother, you know, taking us to see this film. Sure, so. sure. Well, well, for me, I, I think that I, I run into a lot of people who haven't seen it, and because it is such a big part of pop culture now, uh, a lot of people know the references. They they're very well intimate with it and i think that they they still don't really understand what it's like watching from beginning to end because it doesn't follow that typical structure right. uh, this is one of the ones where i enjoyed it and i first saw it and then maybe saw it another one or two more times in the 90s uh but uh, and i've watched it a lot a few times in the last you know five to ten years and you come to appreciate it a little bit more and more when you see how ambitious it was and and how it did everything with with the cast and just the writing and execution on it on just such a small budget i love seeing these movies that kind of i uh, defined uh current generation of directors absolutely and you know pulp fiction to tarantino was like jaws to spielberg you know so it's really cool to kind of see that and how those tones come along as plus it was pretty edgy for a 94 blockbuster, you know, for a 90 totally. to come out in 94 to have that. So yeah. I also liked that they pushed the boundaries there. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, cause this is my first introduction to Tarantino, um, you know, I immediately embraced him as a director. I've seen every, every Tarantino film in the theater since, you know, they've, they've come out and they've always kind of made a, a point to do so. Um, you know, he's probably one of the best at, one of my favorite directors of this generation. 
Um, you know, they keep saying that he's going to stop making movies at a certain point. I hope he doesn't. I, I think he's still making great films. Um, it's just kind of, he's been stuck in that Western mode for a couple of films, but interesting to see, uh, where he'll go next. If he's going to do a sequel to something or, or whatever, whatever yeah, he does, if his, if his Star Trek gets made, that's yeah, that's going to be something else. Uh, cause it's like, where else can he go from here? Well, if, if yeah. it's a Tarantino Star Trek, I'm all for it. And, and this is one of the ones we we're discussing if we were to do a podcast on, you know, just Tarantino and talk about all his movies. But I think that at this point, it, it's very much like, like, uh, like, like Spielberg or Christopher Nolan or just Ridley Scott or these other directors that have a pretty big portfolio. You really wouldn't be able to do deep discussion on a lot of movies since there's so much variety there. Right. Um, so I'm sure that we'll be talking more about his, his movies on individual episodes in the future. Sure. Um, so outside of Pulp Fiction though, I mean, where does it sit you, you, for your personal Tarantino films? Like which ones do you, what, do you kind of lean more towards as being your favorites? My favorite Tarantino, I probably want to say is Inglorious Bastards. Um, yeah. Cause I think it's just a kind of a culmination of everything he's, he's done up to that point. Um, you know, he's, cause you could tell like as a director and his development, he's kind of crafting that, that's that perfect story. And, and, and there's scenes in, in the glorious bastards that are just a marvel to behold. I mean, especially that first like 20 minute scene where it's just basically like a one act play. And it's just it's so, great. it's so good. So ten, I mean, and he brought, he found like Christoph Waltz, who's just, amazing i mean he's just a great actor it really makes that movie but i mean to me that's and, I, and one of the last lines in the movie brad pitt says this might very well be my masterpiece or something like that and i think tarantino feels the same way about inglorious bastards i think it's yeah that movie's you know, excellent yeah it's it's great and um you know uh, one thing about tarantino is he's only really done like one adaptation throughout his entire career like jackie brown was based on a book but everything else he's done has been, um, you know, straight from his, from his brain. And it's allowed him to create this kind of like universe within his film. So, you know, you'll see, especially with like a lot of character names, they're referenced in other movies. And then even like when he's done the Westerns, like these people could possibly be related to other characters that show up, you know, much later on. And he confirmed that he confirmed that all his movies take place in the same universe. Right. Right. You know, to where, for example, um, I might be getting it wrong, but like people in Pulp Fiction, for example, uh, if they were to go to the movies, they'd be going and watching a movie like Kill Bill. Right. Uh, right. So there's a loose connection, but there is a there is a connection there. But that is an interesting way to look at it, which I think is pretty clever. Yeah. You know, it just kind of makes you wonder if he's been walking around this stuff in his head and then he's just kind of slowly making these films or, you know, where is he getting his inspiration from? Yeah. What about what about the ones that are not so hot? Um, well, I like, you want to say like death proof. Yeah. It's kind of, I, I enjoy it for what it is. It doesn't have a high replayability. Yeah. Uh, but it is a little bit long and slow. Right. Um, I mean the best part of that, obviously are the stunts at the end. Um, yeah, that's true. That plays up. But I mean, I've never really been too disappointed in other stuff he's done. Like dust till dawn was, I mean, he's only really doing part of that movie. It's okay, but then it just gets a little redundant when they're killing like several hundred vampires after that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, um, I, I do like Jackie Brown as I watch it more. I mean, I know that's the adaptation, but that's a, that's a great movie. Um, Kill Bill 1 and 2. I uh, wish I saw him like back to back in the theater, but that's uh, that's another one that he might make like a sequel of. I don't know what he's going to do with that, but, you know. But, um, you know, then I think his Westerns are good. I, I thought Hateful Eight was outstanding, and I think it would make a, a really good, like, play, which I think he's also talked about possibly doing. So, I don't know. Yeah, what do you think? The, the, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I need to watch Jackie Brown again. I remember seeing it and kind of being like, eh, you know, yeah, yeah. it's all right. It's nothing too too amazing. Um, but, again, I, I've, it's been such a long time since I've seen that movie, at least, at least 20 years. Yeah. Uh, the Kill Bills are great. And I really liked watching those. Um, yeah, I would say that Death Proof is probably one of the the weaker ones. I mean, Django's still pretty good, uh, but again, I don't know. I I'm just not a huge fan of Reservoir Dogs anymore. Yeah, uh, it just doesn't age for me. Like I mentioned earlier, I disagree. Um, but okay, you know that's just that's just me. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I I get while it's good. I think there's some great scenes and there's some great dialogue and stuff in there. But it's just one of those ones to where. 
I just don't like watching it again anymore. I'm like, I've kind of seen it maybe like once every 10 years is the kind of movie you could watch, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the same kind of replayability for me. Yeah. And I even think like stuff he's had a hand in writing, um, true, uh, true romance. I love that movie. And I mean, his original conception of that movie was a little bit like Pulp Fiction where it was shot out of sequence. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, there's even like something on the internet where it's like uh, true romance Tarantino eyes where it's like, his original script. So they were kind of reimagined the whole movie, but done to his original script. Um, and it's a good adaptation. Like you could definitely watch it and go, yeah, that's definitely something Tarantino would do or say. Um, he was, he was even involved with the story of uh, natural born killers. Wasn't he? He wrote the screenplay. So he, he wrote, okay. the, he wrote the screenplay for that, but what came out was very different. Um, Cause it obviously like ran through Oliver Stone and then like a lot of drugs were also involved. So what came out in the end was, was very different. Hmm. Um, you know, but, um, I mean, it, it could be good, but I, the movie itself isn't like it's something I keep watching either. That's not, you know, I, I think of the two of the two, like true romance is probably the best one. Yeah. I, and I, I would say that with, um, natural born killers, it's one of those movies that's trying to be too provocative to where it kind of doesn't really provide you much substance. Yeah. At least that's how I kind of felt. Yeah. Brad Pitt's great in it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's Tarantino. That's Pulp Fiction. Um, I was kind of kicking this around for a little while. wanted to do a Tarantino and I, I thought this would be a good one to start with. Well, yeah, we had, we had a handful of people also on uh, Facebook that said that they, they liked, they liked Pulp Fiction. So why not? Right. Yeah. You suggest it. We'll, we'll check it out. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Um, so before we wrap up, talking about Pulp Fiction. Let me just, uh, I got a handful of trivia questions here. Some of them hard, maybe some of them are pretty easy. Well, you know, so for all the listeners out there, see if you can follow along. If you're a fan of the movie, see which ones you get right. See which ones you get wrong. Nice. Uh, you ready? I am. All right, here we go. Oh, sorry. Let me kick off here. What does Marcellus Wallace have on the back of his neck? That'd be a bandaid. Yeah, you got that one. The third chapter is titled the Blank situation. The uh, third chapter. The Bonnie situation. That is correct. Uh, what does Honey Bunny call her diner robbery accomplice? Uh, would that be Pumpkin? Pumpkin. Yep. Nice job. Yeah. Um, which other Tarantino character did the director state was the brother of Vincent? Uh, like character from a... Well, I think it would be Vic Vega, and that would be Mr. Blonde from Reservoir Dogs. Mr. Blonde. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yes, that's true. <laughs> uh, what is the failed TV pilot that Mia Wallace acted in? That's uh, Fox Force 5, which actually uh, came to be Kill Bill. Hey, there you like, go. Like, pretty much. I mean, there's a scene in the movie where she describes, like, the, the, the killer assassins from Kill Bill, which I think was pretty cool. All uh, right. Next on, yeah. what is what is the name of the fifties themed diner that Vincent takes Mia Wallace have dinner? That would be Jack Rabbit Slims. Jack Rabbit Slims is correct. Yeah. With what tools does Marcellus Wallace's promise he's going to work go to work on Zed? <laughs> that, would, that would be a blowtorch and a pair of pliers. Sean, a pair of pliers, Al- yeah. Al- Alex for a hundred. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, uh, which which Pulp Fiction actor received an Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor for their role? Um, Samuel L. Samuel L. Yeah. All right, what is the name of the guy that Vincent Vega accidentally shoots in the face? Marvin. Marvin. Yes, good, the, good job I know this there. movie too well. <laughs> I know. Okay, so let's see if I can... Um, Stop me. Let's, let's see if we can step it up. All right. Um, let's see. That one's too easy. I'm not going to give you Royale with cheese. Well, what do Dutch people put on their French fries that disgust jewels? Mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. I okay. fucking drown them in that shit. <laughs> Why does Tony Rocky Horror now speak with a speech impediment? Uh, because Marcellus Wallace threw him out of a window for giving his wife a foot massage. Yep, there you go. <laughs> All right, so complete the line. Check out the big brain on blank. Check out the big brain on Brett. 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 Yeah. Which always kind of sounds like Brad, but it's yeah, no, it's Brett. 
You're a smart uh, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> Um, metric metric system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, complete the complete this line. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I blank? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Yeah, yep. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> all right. What did Brett take from Marcellus Wallace? Uh, briefcase. Yeah, that's an easy one. Give you a little yeah. bumper there. Um, okay, let's see. We already talked about Jack Rabbit Slims. Who serves Mia and Vincent at Jack Rabbit Slims? That'll be Buddy Holly, played by Steve Buscemi. Yes, it is, Buddy Holly. What Chuck Berry song plays during the twist dance off? Um, you never can tell. That's correct. Yeah. All right, what song is Mia Wallace dancing to when Vincent and Mia return? to her home after winning the twin twist contest um girl you'll be a woman soon by urge overkill there you go girl uh, uh, <laughs> bow, 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 bow. And neil diamond you'll cover. be a woman soon. <laughs> all right uh what does mia overdose on come on come on that would be that'd be the heroin that's in uh yeah vincent's jacket where did oh <laughs> where did butch's dad hide his pocket watch while a prisoner in Vietnam. Up his ass. Up his ass. Up That's his ass. correct. We got that one. <laughs> Why is Marcel Walsh trying to kill Butch? Because uh, Butch was supposed to throw a fight and he didn't. He, right? uh, yep, or supposed he, to throw he, a fight he and he didn't. His, he screwed him over, yeah. What ceramic animal does Butch keep his pocket watch on? Kangaroo. Kangaroo. Oh, you're just on fire. Yeah. Who was, who was killed by Butch? Uh, wait. Who was killed by Butch? Oh, Vincent yes. Ve- Vincent Vega. Vincent, what song is Butch singing along with when he encounters Marcellus Wallace? Um, well, I don't know the name of the song, but it's like smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo. Yeah, fla- <laughs> flowers on the wall. <laughs> okay, yeah. counting flowers on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, right. What has got Jules all spooked? Um, well, the fact that the guy came out of the bathroom and shot him a bunch of times and they didn't die. Yeah, being escaped, uh, being shot at close death, you know, or close death experience being shot close yeah, by. Yeah, okay. Um, where does Vincent shoot Marvin? Uh, in the face. In the face. Correct. In the face. Uh, the man <laughs> that Vincent Jules help get to help clean up Marvin's mess is known as who? Ah, uh, the wolf. The wolf. Too easy. What college is Vincent wearing a t-shirt from? Um, Santa Cruz. You see Santa Cruz? Yep, the banana slugs. Yeah. Uh, okay, a couple more. Uh, which animal does Jules consider to be filthy so he does not eat it? <laughs> Pig. Pig's a filthy animal. Pig's a filthy animal. <laughs> uh, which B- other animal B- does B- Jules B- feel B- is dirty? Pig B- tastes good. Pork chop feels good. <laughs> Um, a dog. Dog, yes. Yeah. All right, yeah. Looks like that's all the ones I wrote down. Nice. Yeah, you killed it. Nice job. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, if you haven't seen it, Bolt Fiction is rad. Check it out. It's definitely a good place to start to get introduced to uh, Quentin Tarantino if you're kind of new uh, to his movies and stuff like that. Nice job, Ryan. I think you did a good job uh, kicking off uh, Tarantino on the harsh review here. Thank you. Yeah, but if you guys enjoyed uh, this episode a lot more, head over to our Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Uh, Give us a follow. Uh, We also greatly appreciate some five-star reviews on iTunes. It's super easy. It'll take less than a minute of your life, and it really means a lot to us. So if you haven't done so already, please do so. We we couldn't thank you enough for just kind of going on there and saying, saying your thanks and appreciation. Uh, And if you want to check us out even more, we do have a Patreon account if you're looking to support the show by uh, just sponsoring us a little bit, like a like a PBS thing for a dollar a month. You can sponsor the Harsh Review. Yes. Yes. Um, so we've got a couple things cooking around for our next few episodes coming up. I'm looking to see what we're going to do for the big number 20. Can't believe we're almost there. Oh. I know. I don't know what's going to be just yet. Um, but either way, I'm looking forward to that. Yes. Uh, but we would love more of your guys' suggestions and feedback if you think there's something out there that uh, uh, definitely deserves some 
you know, some discussion, a little bit of review. Yeah. Other than that, I'm pretty happy about this. You feeling Me, good? Yeah, I am. All right. All right. Well, thanks for everybody for stopping by. We will catch you next week on episode 20. My name is Sean. And I'm Ryan. Have a good one.